All right, we are recording. Okay, uh, I'm Greg Lemke, the chair of the Moore Public Housing Agency, and I'll call the January 26 uh, regular meeting to order. Uh, the Moore Public Housing Agency board meeting will be held as a video conference uh, due to COVID-19. The public may not attend in person. There is a time reserved on the agenda for citizens to be heard. Any citizens to be heard can address the board by calling 218-299-5463. And recording of the meeting will be posted on the City of Moorhead webpage following the meeting. If the other board members and staff would like to um, identify themselves. Michael Carbone, Vice Chair. Alexa Dixon, Greg, Secretary. Kelly Dahlquist, City Council Liaison. This is Don Bacon. I'm the director with Moorhead Public Housing. And we have Brian Opsell here, um, who will be presenting our audit report shortly. Okay. Um, so we'll start with the agenda. Are there any agenda amendments? I have no amendments. Okay. Citizens to be heard at this time. No one has called in. I'll keep my eye on the phone. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to uh, approval of minutes. So a request for approval of the December 15th, 2020 meeting minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move to approve. Second. And any questions about the minutes, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Next item is request approval for payment of bills. Um, I know the board always appreciates when I just point out any noteworthy items on this. So just a few things are, we did spend quite a bit of money out of our capital funding grant. Um, 25,000, give or take of that was for our air handler unit project, which we just finished up at the high rise. And then around 100,000 of that was for our roof repair work for multiple scattered site locations. Another thing to note about the payment of bills would be that um, we are in that transition now where we're combining those two residential assistance programs into one under one contract with Ottertail County. So you'll see some you know, uh, we kept them separate through the end of December and then are making that transition in January. So you'll note, like it says, old BCAL. That's what it's talking about because we're going to be merging those departments. Um, and then finally, under our general fund, um, we did spend some of our levy dollars, um, mostly pertaining to legal services for both the Moorhead Affordable Housing LLC, which would be doing the repositioning work, but also um, some legal services associated with developing a purchase agreement for the Maple Court project. Um, and to date, we have received $126,000 um, in levy funding. And I, I believe um, we will not be receiving any more levy checks. Um, and we've spent about $27,000. So we still are you know, paying attention to the, the, that funding and what we can do with that funding to expand affordable housing. Um, we've also received $88,000 to date resulting from the clay HRA transfer. Um, so that will be very useful to the agency in addressing unmet capital needs and other areas going forward. Great news, most of it. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the uh, payment of bills. I move to approve payment of bills. Second. So a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments for Don? In favor? Aye. Aye. Please. So move on to business. And the first item is request approval of the audit results. So we want the report first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's probably smart. <laughs> okay. It's all good. <laughs> Um, so I've done this a few different ways. I saw that the uh, audit report and the audit committee letter were PDF within the email that got sent out with the board agenda. Would you like me to still try to share 
of the report on the screen, or do you want to just follow along? Preference. I have a hard copy, so I'm okay, but. Yeah. Brian, if you want, maybe I'll um, share it. I forgot to put the agenda up earlier. I'm terrible about remembering to do that. But that way, if people are, for anyone who might be watching the meeting, then they can kind of see some of the report. So I will uh, share my screen here. Okay. Um, and are you bringing up just the auto report, Don, or? Okay, I'll, I'll start with the communication on the audit committee letter, just very briefly. Um, sure. It's a two-page report that really just goes through the audit process itself, and if there were any major changes to uh, 2020, there were no new accounting policies adopted, so you shouldn't see any major changes to the presentation or, or how the numbers were arrived at. Uh, we have no difficult, or we had no difficulties performing the audit. No dis disagreements with management. So um, that report should look very similar to what it has in prior years. Uh, no major changes there. Um, I guess I also will point out that as we go through the audit, if we come across items that we feel like um, you're not following your policies, or we feel like policies could be improved, we might have a management letter uh, comment addendum to that report, and uh, so. The fact that we don't just indicates that we feel like your policies are operating as they are intended and effectively. Um, when we get into the report, we still have a couple of findings just due to the size really of the entity, but nothing that we felt like wasn't being followed according to, to what you have set up already. So uh, bring that to your attention. Um, into the audit report then, pages two through four of the independent auditor's report is the uh, audit opinion. And we've issued an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements. So this it's the best uh, or the highest level of assurance that we can give that they're fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, pages uh, five through eight, this is the management discussion and analysis section. And it's a, a high level overview of the uh, some condensed information that provides some comparative information. So it's maybe if you're just looking for some highlights, um, they start on, on page five. And then uh, if you look at page six, for example, you can see the difference between your 2020 and 2019 income statement totals, um, where you're going to see operating revenues and operating expenditures. Um, if you look Comparatively wise, you can see net operating income was almost the same in 2019 and 20. Um, and, and this is not a really surprise with how the entity works. You know, the more grant money you get, the, the more funding that you spend as well. So they usually go hand in hand. Um, and the real difference for 2020 versus 2019 really, I think, was the capital fund program uh, usage. So you can see the non operating income almost $300,000 compared to 43,000 of the prior year. Most of that was due to uh, capital fund pros, uh, proceeds. And we'll get into more details, but this is, like I said, just a nice little snapshot of, of where you're at in 2020 versus 2019. Uh, page nine is the first audited financial statement. This is the statement of net position. And this is where we're combining all of your funds into basically one opinion unit. And when, if you look at the bottom of page nine and work yourself up, the, the bottom number there is the net position, which is your equity in the entity, which is a little bit over $5.8 million. Of that number, the line right above that, the 783,000, that would be the available amount. So it's not tied into fixed assets. It's available for, for spending, um, no restrictions on that. Um, the only other major difference from, from last year uh, would be that notes payable line. Uh, about five lines from the bottom of 292,950. And I guess what I want to bring to your attention is that's a, a special kind of note where eventually it'll probably become a grant. And so you just have to, to keep on operating like you are operating for low income and that'll eventually roll into your equity below. But for purposes of today, it's still technically a loan if you were to change operations or the way that you handled it, you'd actually owe that money back. So. Um, and Brian, you're speaking about the uh, POHP grant, correct? That is correct. Yep. Thank you. Yep. It's officially a loan, um, but it, you don't have to pay it back as long as you comply with the requirements of the loan. True statement. Yep. Um, 
And then if you want to flip the page to uh, page 10, um, once again, three lines to the bottom, you can see the overall change was a, a deficit $28,643. Um, you know, this this includes depreciation expense of over $300,000. So if you kind of take that into consideration, that's a, you know, really a non-cash item. And so the overall, the, the change without that would have been a positive almost $300,000. So I like to bring that to your attention just because depreciation is just a factor of, of an estimate that gets uh, uh, factored over the course of time for based off of fixed assets. And uh, sometimes it's nice to back that out to, to get your, I guess, a truer picture of where you ended up. Um, the next page then is the cash flow page. Um, about five lines to the bottom, you can see a net decrease in cash and cash equivalents, about $57,000 or 58,000. Um, you know, this happens for a variety of reasons. It's a timing issue sometimes with when you're paying or receiving funds for grants. Um, also, you had, you know, quite a few uh, fixed asset additions in 2020, almost $670,000. So uh, that's you know, one of the major reasons that went backwards. All in all, you still have $875,000 in cash. So no red flags or major issues that I see there. Um, the next several pages, which are pages 13 through 22, are the footnotes to the financial statements. Um, lots of information on your accounting policies, fixed asset detail, long-term debt detail. Um, we won't go through any details or uh, we won't go page by page for that right now, but if there are questions, we can certainly circle back. Pages 23 through 26, um, as I mentioned in the front of the financials, they're combined. So if you're looking for how your low rent public housing, general business activities or CFP uh, grants are running or, or Ross, you can see the details in the back here. So um, just another way to kind of look at it to see, you know, which funds maybe are operating better than other funds. And, and you know, usually there's an intent there uh, of spending down funds or, or receiving funds based off of timing. But uh, we have the details for you back there. Um, pages 28 and 29 is the government auditing standards letter, and it's a high level overview of your internal control structure as a whole. And we have two, uh, or actually three repeat findings, which virtually all uh, entities your size have this um, related to preparation of the financial statements by the auditors, uh, material journal entries, and then separation of duties. And so, you know, my analysis on those is always you're probably something that you're not going to get away from but do you have controls in place to help mitigate those risks you know with review of the financial statements for example before we issue them um, somebody reviewing the AJEs before posting them separation of duties with a board approval of bills so we feel like those things are in place and operating so that it does help reduce the risks but um, the risks are still there so we'd bring those to your attention and then lastly on page 32 this is the Minnesota legal compliance letter. Uh, the state provides us with some various audit guides for pledge collateral, conflicts of interest, bid work, et cetera. Uh, we have a clean report here, so no, no issues uh, uh, to, to note. Um, so that was a pretty quick run through. I'd certainly like to open up for questions or comments. Anybody have any questions or comments? Questions for Brian or comments about the audit? Because my only comment is that, uh, well, first of all, to thank Brian for a clear presentation and and uh, it just appears to be pretty much status quo as we have been in previous years. Is that an accurate reflection, Brian? Yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, the fact that there are no management letter comments, I think is kind of a indicator in my mind that everything, you know, there's no corners being cut or anything to get things done. Um, so I think that's usually the first sign of things if, start, if you start going south is that, you know, we find little internal control things here and there and pretty soon you got, you know, 10 pages worth of things that could be fixed. And so the fact that we have none, I think, you know, shows that, um, you know, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and following policies. Very good. <clears throat> Anything else? Any other questions? 
Thank you for your uh, presentation. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Looks like we're good. Yep. Thanks, for Brian. Thanks for the presentation. Get easier for us to some of us to follow what's all written in there. So appreciate it. Mm -hmm. No problem. Have a have a good day. You too. Thanks. So uh, a request for board approval, a lot of results. Resolution, if I'll entertain a motion for that. I shall move. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Next item is the agency wage schedule. Can you guys see my screen on back on the agenda now? Yep. Yes. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> okay, let me move down to that part just so we can people can follow along. Okay, so this item I provided a little background in the memo. Um, the board passed a wage schedule with the assistance of Baker Tilly that specializes in developing wage schedules and job descriptions. Um, back in 2016, shortly before I joined the organization. Um, and at that time, we didn't have a service coordinator position in place with the Ross grant. Um, since then, we have, were able to get that grant back um, with the agency. Um, and hopefully are going to be having a, another three year renewal. We're still waiting to hear from HUD. Um, but just as I've done more research on wage schedules and HR issues, um, wanted to add that position formally into our wage schedule um, and want the board to basically adopt their recommendation. Um, Baker Tilly, they included a um, short memo here, but basically they did um, a, the same process they used back in 2016 with the other staff where they did a job evaluation survey um, with our Ross coordinator and then with myself as the supervisor. They reviewed the job description. Um, I provided them information about the grant requirements. Um, and from there, they made a recommendation um, both looking at internal responsibilities across staff and um, how the points should be spread um, based on the responsibility level. And then also looking at the external market um, to make sure that the position is competitive within the market. And then I did include the full um, wage schedule um, that includes the increase that, you know, the board adopted a COLA, I think in 2019. Um, but this is basically the 2016 wage schedule with that COLA implemented um, and adding in that, that service coordinator position. Any questions? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to update the agency wage schedule. Move to update. Second. A motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion case. The last item of business is request for qualifications for sharp view roof replacement. So this item, we put out a request for qualifications to work with an architectural firm that would then assist us with drawing up specifications, um, putting it out for bid, selecting a contractor and doing some contract management and oversight. Um, we do need to replace our roof at Sharpview. Um, that was outlined in our capital needs assessment. And then just in the last six months to a year, I think I've shared with the board that we're starting to see indicators that it, it needs to move up on the priority list. Um, so we wanna get that out for bid um, as soon as possible um, and probably have construction start this summer. With our procurement, policy. Um, it's a little different when we're selecting an architecture or consultant in that we don't um, ask for the cost of their services. We just specifically look at their qualifications and we rank them based on our criteria 
and then um, talk with them about cost. And if it's reasonable, we proceed with our top scorer. Um, our procurement policy doesn't require that the board approve um, who we select, but we have often brought this forward to the board to keep the communication strong. Um, so we did issue this RFQ request for qualifications um, about a month ago. Um, we received four proposals um, from four different firms. Um, I think I've shared with the board before that our experience with RFQs with these kinds of entities is that we always get very, very highly qualified firms that respond. Um, and that was the case with this RFQ as well, where all four of the responses were very qualified, strong proposals. Um, we wouldn't really have any concern working with any of the of the firms um, that submitted a proposal. Um, but we did, you know, with points um, weigh some criteria looking at the at the project and we are recommending that we work with um, MJ Burns as our first choice um, and that we would proceed with talking with them about cost. Um, and if reasonable, work with them. If, if, if not reasonable, we could move to the next um, company, which was FOSS on our list. Um, and part of the reason for selecting MJ Burns, there were a number of factors that we looked at, but they did um, do the Sharpview roof replacement um, 20 years ago. And the people that would be working on this project now are the same people that worked on it then. Um, and so we do feel like there are some efficiencies in that they have documentation at the ready that they can work from. Um, and in addition to all their other qualifications, which were, were very strong. So that's who we're, re we're recommending that we proceed with. And I did put it out as a resolution. You can decide as a board if you wanna formally vote on it or if you just wanna see if you have any questions for me about proceeding. Any preference from anybody? I guess as, as long as it's there as a resolution, we might as well vote on it. So I'll entertain a motion. I move. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I do have a question, Don, on just reminding me, is that is it a flat roof on Sharpview? It is. So when we talk in replacement, it's not, it's going to uh, stay a flat roof. We're not going to. Yeah, when I've talked with, um, so from our physical needs assessment, there were kind of two routes that we could go. One is a straight up replacement of what we currently have. There was another route that's about double the cost, which would increase some efficiency. Um, but in talking with our maintenance staff, we really feel like given all of the capital needs that we have, and we've been going through a lot of that more recently in preparing for our next five-year plan, we think the money would be best spent with a straight up replacement of what we currently have, which would buy us around another 20 years. Um, in terms of the roof quality. So we're really looking, I think there's just a couple minor changes we wanna make, like we wanna build in a walkway um, for them cause there's rock on the roof and we wanna increase the venting a little bit um, for the water basins cause that came up in the physical needs assessment. But by and large, we're looking to do basically just update what we have. Okay. I just know that in this area with all the snow and flat roofs can kind of take a beating sometimes if we have a lot of snow but okay uh other business is executive director updates okay just a few updates and i'll go back to the main agenda here um our 2021 public hearing i just wanted to check in with board members on that um, normally we've had our public hearing in february every year this year um, we're thinking that we should push it out a little bit further um, for a couple reasons. One is that um, I mentioned earlier, Tony and I are going to be working with Nan McKay um, on some um, updates to our ACOP, our admissions and continued occupancy policy. And just with their schedule, it's going to take a little 
more time for us to work with them um, on making those changes. And of course, any changes we would make would be subject to a 45 day public comment period, you know, and public hearing um, before a board vote. Um, the other reason just has to do with COVID and um, ideally it would be nice to meet in person um, for the public hearing. I think that would generate more um, engagement I know sometimes we don't have anyone show up, but we try to, you know, um, at least create an environment that's accessible, um, as well as our resident um, council meetings. Um, it would give us um, a little more time to work with um, before bringing people in person to discuss things. Um, so any anyway, we're looking at May. We want to have it before the end of the fiscal year. So we're looking at that fourth Tuesday in May. Um, so if any of you have any input on that, you know, let me know. Um, but we just felt like, you know, February might be a little soon, given given all that we've got going on. Um, and then just to see about the capital funding grant, um, last meeting I put together a document for the first time for the board where you could really just see all the different, um, the grants that we have active, how much money we've spent, what projects we have and how we're budgeting for those projects. And I just decided I'm gonna keep updating that and just including it with the board packet so that you can stay current on how we're using those funds. Um, Cause it does ebb and flow based on how projects maybe compare to their original estimate, what actually happens or needs that might come up where we need to make adjustments to the budget. So I'll just continue to include that and, and feel free to let me know if you have any, any questions on how we're using our capital funding grant. Um, we do have to have that item approved in our five-year plan, which is approved by the board and under public comment before we would spend the money on that item. Um, and then finally, just an update on board membership. Um, Izat Haider, who has been on our board and served on our board, did decide to resign from the board. Um, I was under the impression that we had a new board member that would be appointed at the council meeting last night, but I just saw he, his name wasn't on the slate. There was no one from Moorhead Public Housing. So I have reached out to him and um, I think he's very interested and seems like a great fit that he would serve really well. But I'm just trying to work through some communication with the city right now on when he will be officially appointed. Um, he was not able to join us today on this short of notice anyway. So possibly he'll be able to join us by our February meeting. And then um, I did have a quick interaction with Shelly about a resident lead that we have for resident commissioner. Um, so when Tony's back in the office, I'm going to talk with her about that. And um, we may have an opportunity, um, which with those two positions, that would bring us back to a full board. So um, just want to say I appreciate the three of you because I know that you all have to be here in order for us to have a meeting um, and we'll keep working towards um, getting a full board. Um, and then my only last update is in the last meeting, I talked about the COVID emergency sick leave policy um, and things were kind of up in the air with Congress in terms of what they were going to do about that. It ex had expired on December 31st. Congress did pass um, a continuation of that with the caveat that employers, it is optional for employers versus before it was mand mandatory. So again, with the communication we had at the last meeting, we have proceeded with um, choosing to continue to offer that to our employees. Um, it will still result in some tax savings if, you know, with there's a payroll tax benefit. Um, if employees do need it, there's a benefit to the employer. Um, so that's helpful. Um, but it is not a, um, Whereas before it was a required, you know, employee rights poster that went up. Now it's really, it depends on the organization. And I just think it's the right thing to do, particularly when you have essential workers who are um, by, by nature of their job more exposed to COVID. So just having strong personnel and policy, policy in place to protect workers if they were to be exposed. Those are my updates. Any questions about any of that? No, I, I, uh, I agree with the public hearing, putting that off as long as we possibly can to hopefully get some some stuff interactions in, per, uh, in person. 
and uh, yeah, it'd be nice to have a full board. It's been, it's been a long time since we've had full a full board. So yeah, yeah, and full participation as well. Yeah, it it seems like even when we do have board members, they're they're not always present. And I know I've missed a few, but um, yeah, we just need a a full slate of board members that are fully engaged. Right. Yeah. But you're right. The, the three of us have been pretty consistent, but yeah, we need people who can also be here uh, once a month. So looks like the next item is to uh, request to go into a uh, closed exec session for the purpose of considering offers or counter offers for the purchase of real property described as Clay County parcel 58.60. Point zero two zero zero located at N Twelfth Street and Seven in the Henry R. Peterson edition of the City of Moorhead. So, we'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. I so move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. So, we will go into executive session. And it looks like we just have attorney's report. Yep, and happen. there's no attorney's report today. So. <laughs> All I'm right. happy to say that. Yes. <laughs> All right. So the meeting is adjourned. All right. See everybody. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.